Hi, everyone, and welcome back to season eight of the Propcast. I'm Louisa Dickens, your host of the Propcast and co-founder of LMRE, the global prop tech recruitment and search consultancy. The aim of each episode is to introduce you to a prop tech innovator and discuss how their work has created a shift in focus when it comes to digitalizing the built environment. If you're interested in finding out more about prop tech or applying for a job in this space, or keen to know who the big players are that are moving and shaking the real estate industry, we have you covered. We'll be bringing you an episode each week to connect you to the VCs, prop tech startups, and real estate professionals from around the globe. Today on the PropCast, we'll be speaking to Liza Benson, partner of Modern Ventures on Women in VC. Welcome to the show, Liza. Thanks, Lou, for having me. Now, on this show, we will cover Liza's journey to becoming a partner at one of the most prominent female-led VC firms in our space. I know, right, there aren't too many of them out there. And they have a portfolio of something like 100 plus companies across real estate, mortgage, finance, insurance, and home services. We'll hear how Liza balances her time between board members of several companies, something which plenty of those listening dream of doing, whilst also finding time to raise a whopping 200 mil fund like they did in August last year. We also hear about plans for deployment and what Liza Constant and their team look for when evaluating a prop tech business or a general tech company. So if you're a founder looking to raise, please listen closely. And last, but definitely not least, we touch upon Liza's personal experience in being a woman in this space, a woman in BC, and the effective initiatives on DEI she's experienced and seen that works in some of um, their portfolio companies. And um, so now we've had a brief sort of introduction to lovely Liza. Liza, why don't you let us know, one, how you came to Modern Venture, the meeting, your partner, Constance, you started off investment banking. I think you were at First Union. You became a partner of Starbucks Partners. But yeah, 2018, everything changed. So let us hear about your journey. No, absolutely. I've been in venture and growth equity for well over 20 years. I started my career, yes, in investment banking for about three years to really learn the technical aspects of modeling. Mm -hmm. But actually joined my first fund in April of 2000, which was a very interesting time to obviously join the venture world. I actually joined a venture capital fund that was part of Bear Stearns in April of 2000, in which we had just closed a $358 million fund. Well, Mm. if we're all familiar with the history of April 2000, very quickly, the bottom fell out of the market. The existing fund that we had at that firm quickly went from a 4X to a 0.5. And we were left with trying to figure out what to save, what to let go, and you know how to navigate through this very interesting time. I have to say it was a very interesting time to join venture capital, a very instructive time in many ways, because often we've just seen over the last, obviously, five plus years, everything is up and to the right. But when things aren't up and to the right, you really learn all aspects of the documents on the downside, which is very mm-hmm. important to understand, whether it's anti-dilution protection that you have from down rounds, protective provisions, all of these different things just a fabulous learning experience for me to actually see what happens in a downturn and see actual legal docs in action uh, when you had circumstances that were not necessarily particularly favorable. I stayed with that group at Bear Stearns actually for about 14 years, even past Bear being bought by J.P. Morgan. Our group was sort of subsumed into a large asset manager called Highbridge, and we stayed there and raised many additional funds. I left Highbridge to join Starvest, a B2B SaaS investor. And that's actually where I met Constance. Constance and I were on a board together and Constance had a very much a verticalized focus. And this was very attractive to me because VC dollars keep on raising more and more every year. There's very little differentiation sometimes out there in the market. And this verticalized approach that Constance had developed with Modern Ventures is where our LPs, which are mostly strategic, are highly integrated into our investment process. Where we're stacking the deck for our companies, our LPs need to become the customers, the companies that we're investing in. So I thought it was a really interesting model. And she actually approached me and said after a few years that she'd been looking for someone just like me and would I be interested in joining Modern. So that's how that journey started. I mean, I've been at Modern about four years and we've had a great run so far. We finished investing the first fund, which was 43 million. And then, you know, just raised our second fund last summer where our original goal was 125 million and our cap was 150. And we're able to blow through that cap, get our LPs to agree to go to 200 million and really now come out with one of the largest real estate tech funds out there. 
that's seriously impressive. Congratulations. We'll go in, I guess, a bit later into a bit more about your strategic investors as well, because you have some pretty big names that obviously believe in you and that are supporting you. Hi, I'm Nelson from Property Quants. We are on a hands-on, in-depth course that will teach you to apply data science and machine learning to real estate. To learn more, visit propertyquants.com slash training. We also run a revolutionary course that will allow anyone to gain data science skills without needing to learn programming. To learn more about that, visit the nocodecourse.com. On either side, be sure to key in the code LMRE5 for a special 5% discount. Now for our audience, let us know what makes Modern unique, other than obviously two female heads as well, and what that means to you. And is there a certain mission behind the fund as well? Absolutely. And we are differentiated, you know, from your typical, I would say, prop tech fund. And we actually don't even use the term prop tech. We use the term real estate tech. The fund was originally conceived by Constance as a strategic fund as the National Association of Realtors. And the basic premise was, how can I stack the deck? How can I help my companies in the most profound way? And that's by bringing customers. And one deal that Constance did at NAR was actually DocuSign. And DocuSign is very interesting because It's really not a prop tech company in any way, right? It's obviously has a lot of applicability in our industries, but has many other verticals as well. And so DocuSign became in many ways the model for how we work with companies. We say that we're an early stage investor in real estate, home services, and fintech and insure tech having to do with real estate. But we really think about things in a much broader perspective. Let me give you an example. So we have a company in our portfolio called Stride. Stride provides 1099 healthcare benefits. And you say, why in the world would a real estate tech fund be investing in a 1099 healthcare company? Well, because there's you know, a million and a half residential real estate agents out there. We're all 1099. So we took something that's working in other industries like Uber and Instacart and brought mm-hmm. it into real estate. So we think about real estate tech in a very broad way. We actually like companies that have multi-verticals because the more verticals, the bigger the market. And also not subject to the cyclicality of real estate necessarily entirely. So we really love the companies that have these multi-vertical applications. Not to say that we don't do things that are just focused on real estate, but we also have this broader thesis that we call outside in, where we bring the best technologies from outside the industry into the real estate industry. I think we're also at Anamari, we're trying to stay away from the whole partners in prop tech. I think there's so many different verticals that it touches anything of an sort of built environment, whether it's even mobility, the content, like it's crazy. There's a new vertical almost coming out every bloody month, which I'm trying to learn about. Going back to obviously talking about your raise and your strategic investors and some of the names are Avalon Bay Communities, Greystar as well as some leading real estate companies of the world, which for the audience listening in, they'll know them. It's Oak Tree Capital Management, it's Relog, all supporting you. Now, Constance obviously generated a lot of these investors itself, but how do you continue to support them and go about it? Because I'm sure lots of people would die to have these names backing them. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We take our corporate partnerships very seriously. We actually have just hired a, a fabulous woman who will soon announce who's going to be heading up that area for us. Fundamentally, you know, we're talking about the Avalon Bays and the Camden properties and the mm-hmm. creators of the world. Our venture returns, Lou, even if we do 10x, are not going to be that impactful to them. I mean, yes, it's great that we get great venture returns, but really what they're investing in us for is to improve the operations and ultimately the NOI of their businesses. So we need to make sure that we're bringing the best tech to these companies so that they can fundamentally innovate and improve their businesses with technology. So we have very systematized corporate programs that we work with our LPs on. We also have another program that we call Passport. Passport is our business development group. So we actually have five full-time employees whose job it is to integrate our portfolio companies with our LPs. This is not email intros, Lou. What this is, is a systematized approach over a seven-month program where all of our companies are led through mentorship with our LPs and larger advisor group of 700 real estate execs getting deals channeled, whatever they need out of that network, we're going to deliver to them in a very systematized way. Well, yeah, this leads me very nicely on into my next question. I'd love to sort of pick your brains over. And so with the audience, now you mentioned, obviously, you've got about 700 needed to obviously help these companies, which is over 100 plus. Some notable names, those listening in, it's the likes of Icon, Port, 
Hippo, Better Mortgage, like I said, they cover real estate, mortgage, finance, insurance, you name it. Is there anything modern particularly looks for when evaluating a company? Is it going deep into, because obviously you're almost vertical agnostic. Is it the founders are like believing in them? I know your seed to sort of series B, correct me, I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure. Is there anything that you really sort of look out for? Absolutely. I mean, from an investment perspective, just to give the audience an idea, we generally invest what we call sort of late C to early B. Typically now with the new fund, we are leading rounds with about four to seven million dollar checks. We also have the ability to do growth investments out of this fund. We're going to be doing up to three of those in this new fund. In terms of, you know, what we look for, obviously founders are sort of, you know, the number one thing that you're looking for. You could have the greatest market, the greatest business model without the right leaders to execute on it. Obviously, that won't necessarily work. It's very important for us to look at a few elements outside of, you know, the personality and drive, you know, of the founders that we're backing. One of the big things that we always look for is the TAM, the total addressable market. And, you know, while that might seem obvious, we look at it in a, a very systematic way in which we really peel back the layers of the onion to truly understand what is the addressable market. So for us, that's really important. As I mentioned earlier, we love companies that have a foothold in real estate or want a foothold in real estate, but also have multi-vertical application. More verticals, the bigger the TAN, the less cyclicality you have that is inherent in real estate. So that is another thing that we absolutely look for, which is the multi-vertical application. Another element that we look at is the business model. What is the cost to acquire a customer? What is the long-term value of that customer? What are the fundamental economics of the business at scale? And we do spend a lot of time in almost a private equity type way in sort of modeling out where we think the business will go and where the unlocks are and where the business model will look at, like at scale from a margin perspective. So those are some of the things that we look at. And then most importantly, I probably should have mentioned first is the applicability to our partners. The mm. greatest deal in the world, we will not do it unless we can stack the deck in some ways with our larger group of LPs and advisors. That's a lot of things that you evaluate. Hi. I'm Anthony Slumbers from the Real Innovation Academy, home of the Future Proof Real Estate course, designed to accelerate your real estate career. To learn more, please visit realinnovationacademy.com slash LMRE for details and a 25% discount. We spoke about this earlier. Those listening in, modern inventors have a very lean, impressive team. There is 12 of them. It's more women in it just over but that's a hell of a lot of work and things to cover and whilst providing a good service to your MLPs. Liza now on top of all of this you are on various boards as well whether it's sort of super home services, Wide Vine, which is I think sold to Google recently, Weber for hiring sold to IBM. At NMRE lots of people write in saying there's any board roles and sort of dream of becoming a board member or various businesses and want to do sort of whether it's like, you know, a week, a year or something like that. But there's a hell of a lot of commitments and work that is involved. What is it like balancing all of this and being on the board of various companies? I think today I'm on eight or nine boards as a, either a board member or a board observer. So board meetings, in my view, should really be mostly strategy sessions. So what you really don't want to do necessarily is just go over the financials and run through a deck. I keep in touch with all of my CEOs on a bi-weekly or monthly basis for one-on-one -on -one phone calls. So I really can get the real feeling of how the business is working. So from my perspective, those board meetings should really be a larger group strategy session and all the information in terms of financials and models and bookings and whatnot should come prior to that. So that's how I like to manage that we're on. From the perspective of the executives who are running the companies, they all think about modern almost as a strategic investor. So we're not necessarily going to help them with their budget or their comp plan, but what we are going to help them do is get customers. And that is the number one role that we play as board members is to be that strategic value, that industry knowledge, and that customer generating entity. So that's surely what all founders, that's the end goal for them. <laughs> Right. Okay. Now going on to the questions, which I personally, and I know my audience want to hear your answers to and your thoughts behind it. You've had an extremely successful career and will carry it on. Is there any advice that you give for women looking to get into this investment space, whether they're coming from the banking, the consultancy side, the VC side, 
what's your sort of personal experience been and any sort of tips for those listening in? Well, I think that having the technical background, there's two ways to come into BC. There's from the industry side in which you work for a particular startup that was successful or maybe multiple startups in different roles, or there's sort of the investment banking and consulting route. I obviously came from the investment banking consulting route. I mean, I think it is important to have those core skills of, of modeling, deck building, you know, just sort of that strategic thinking in a very systematized way that you're given yeah. from sort of either are there banking or consulting? There are a lot more women in the younger ranks than, you know, I've certainly ever seen in my 25 years in the business. And I think that is really encouraging. I think what we're not seeing as much of, unfortunately, is, you know, women partners. It's still, you know, a very, very low number. I always tell people to make it your advantage. Like you're always going to be remembered because there's not a lot of lives as in venture capital. There's not a lot of confidences. You're never forgotten, right? Everyone will remember you on a Zoom call eight guys and you. I always just say to make it to your advantage and make your voice heard because people very much value the opinions and you'll be a re remembered person. Yeah, no, I agree with that. But it's female founders. It's especially in a world when you're pitching to a lot of, I know I, I spend a lot of my time pitching to tech founders, but obviously we're doing a lot of work in the consultancy space and lots of them are men, but it's just making sure your voice is heard. They want to listen, but when you have so many other men in the room, deeper voice and everything, like they just have to have confidence and back yourself. Don't be afraid to speak up. It's a lot more of the larger businesses and investment plans. Maybe some of your investors also creating new sort of women innovators program, like I saw one by Blackstone the other week. And they're also not only teaching them about, say, the investment side, some teaching them more the technical side as well. So if people want to go and say any of your portfolio companies and learn about the product, the data on this side, there's all these new career pathways for women, which I think if you do a bit more research, more of these large businesses, there's so many more career opportunities, but it's just taking that leap and trying something new. I think it's a bit of a unique time. I think one of the aspects of venture capital and finance in general, which has been a limiting factor for women as they start to have families, is the, you know, insane amount of travel you did. And in my career, I usually was on the road almost every week. We're in a unique time right now where it has become easier to balance that work-life balance. And I think that's a unique time. And I think that's going to be a huge benefit for women going forward. Yeah. Had various conversations with but it's the tech companies, consultancies about how to obviously attract and retain talent. And it's also about creating that balanced lifestyle, letting people who have families work from home, contributing to, I don't know, childcare, all these sort of things. So yeah, the workplace is changing as everyone keeps doing webinars about. Okay, this is our final question until we go into the LMRE part. In terms of the, uh, is there any sort of positive experience personally for you or any successful changes maybe some of your various portfolio companies have implemented to ensure DEI? Lou, you really hit on some of it, which is giving people some of the flexibility that they need to balance both of these things. And I think, you know, women, we have a lot of them. They're highly organized creatures who always are on point and on time. And giving people the flexibility to perhaps take from three to 4.30 off because kids are getting home from school and letting them then finish a project later at night. And that's really fundamentally how I work as well, which is, you know, a great blessing for me and my kids where, you know, I do take some time off, you know, when they get home from school and I'm working into the night. And that's just the way that I'm able to balance this. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that, Martha Liza. I was doing some research the other day. Can you believe it? That some of the biggest companies in the world didn't exist 30 years ago, the likes of Facebook and Uber. On the other hand, real estate is a total juxtaposition, being the oldest asset class in the world. We often hear about the property industry being a slow mover and the need for prop tech is clear to improve solutions and take advantage of the data being gathered. We saw 21 billion in investment into prop tech in 2020, and it was predicted a further increase of 25% in 2021, which has already been surpassed which means there'll be plenty to talk about when it comes to the innovation of the built environment. EY reported that 53% of real estate owners think that they don't have the in-house talent to adopt technology successfully. But technology-minded talent and leadership, the implementation and widespread adoption of your product might be proving tricky. If that is the case, we are here to help. So head to our website, lmre.tech, and we can find the right talent for your company's needs. Now we're coming to the final part, which is the LMRE part. And so I always touch upon a main lesson you've learned throughout your successful career. M is, you mentioned anyone 
maybe a product or service shout out, maybe one of your strategic partners, completely down to you. R is what's been the most rewarding part of working in this space or venture capital. And E is what are you most excited about for 2022? I think one of the main lessons that I've learned throughout my career is to never have religious type beliefs in either a company or an idea. I think you always have to be open to the information that comes in, open to criticism, open to other thoughts. I think where venture capitals trip up is falling in love in many ways with their deals and not seeing their child's flaws in many ways. And I think it's something where that's why we have partners. That's why we have other people on our teams, because it is by nature a collaborative enterprise and being open to others' thoughts and ideas is super important. So that to me is, you know, a key lesson. In terms of the rewards, I mean, I think the best thing about, you know, my job is that it changes absolutely every day. There's no actual schedule that has to get done necessarily. Obviously, we've got LP letters and meetings and such, but, you know, it's very much self-directed in terms of what I'm interested in, where I think there's growth. And I think that's a really unique sort of position to be in where you can self-direct in terms of where you see the growth in the industry, obviously within the bounds of what your fund is investing in. So I think that's just a really awesome part of being a partner in a venture capital fund. I'll give a little plug for one of my deals. We recently invested in an EV charging company called Zeal. Mm. And what Zeal does is it has an EV charger that does not need Wi-Fi or cell service. And this is really important for multifamily operators, commercial operators, and pathologists. They don't need to wire those garages to have EV charging. Today, EV cars are a single digit percentage. By 2025, they're going to be probably 20, 25%. And only a half percent of public parking spots today have EV chargers. So I am super excited about this company. I think that the lack of connectivity that they need, they use Bluetooth on your phone to transmit information, is going to be a real game changer for the multifamily and commercial industry. For those who don't know what EV is, it means all electric vehicles. Right, lines in the final one. What are you most excited about? I think I'm most excited about being at a venture fund that is focused on the real estate industry. We really have a completely greenfield opportunity here. You have an industry that has been, in many ways, resistant to technology, where this pandemic and, you know, leading up to the pandemic has really changed the attitude of the leaders in the real estate industry. They understand that technology is going to be the differentiator and the engine for growth in their operating income. So I'm very excited to be in an industry that, you know, fundamentally is 10, 15 years behind the Fortune 500. It's kind of like looking at cable before Netflix. That's usually what I compare it to. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. So everyone who's in this space, hang up tight for about the next 15 years. I have lied that it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast, sharing your insights, your experiences, and I'm very excited to see what you do with this fund in terms of um, next investments as well. So thank you very much. And then um, we'll catch up after the show. Thanks, Liv. Thank you for joining us this week on the PropCast and a big thanks to our guests and our sponsors, Cretech and Reentech. Make sure you visit our website, lmre.tech, where you can subscribe to our newsletter, keep up our industry news and events, or if you're looking for your next career move, it's all on there. The PropCast can be found on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, where all good content is found. Whilst you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate it if you could spread the word and tell a friend about it, or even write us a review. And I'll catch you next week. Making high quality podcasts like this takes a lot of work. That's a fact, but not when you hire Copus. With our white glove experience, we handle everything for you from guest outreach all the way through publishing and promotion. We handle it all. You show up to hold great interviews like these and build relationships with your guests. We take care of everything else. Podcasting is not just about the audience. Every podcast interview is the start of a brand new relationship. With a weekly podcast, you would build relationships with 52 ideal partners or prospects through podcast interviews over the next 12 months. Do you believe 52 new relationships could grow your business? We do. Why not contact me today? Jason at copus.com. J-A-S-O-N at K-O-P-U-S.com. And let's talk.